All right, so I'm going to give a disclaimer. All right, this is kind of a pet peeve of mine. <clears throat> Whenever you respond to any type of large accident, and we're going to talk about terrorism. That's going to be our next chapter, but uh, chapter, but for this one, uh, extrication. When you get on scene, know your role. It's a huge pet peeve. Okay, the police officers are there. They're, they're doing their job directing traffic, make sure the scene is safe for us. EMS is, is dealing with patient care, and fire department is dealing with extrication, or the extrication crew team, they're dealing with that. And everybody has their role. So if you're dealing with patient care, and you have this just unsatiable urge to pick up a piece of equipment and start cutting on the door, just stop, all right? Um, and just the scene goes a lot smoother. I've seen it all every different every different way. I've seen where the EMS was trying to do extrication while the fire department was trying to do extrication in patient care, and it was just and there was just bad words get said and people get really upset. So as we move to this chapter, uh, we're we're this is an introduction. Okay, this is not an extrication class. It would it would be great if it was. I love extrication classes, but this is not one. <laughs> Sorry. But what it is, is an introduction of, of what's going on during an extrication, some of the stages. So as you're sitting in a car doing patient care, you kind of know, hey, this is what's going on during the extrication process. So that's all this is, just kind of introduction. So let's, let's just take it for what it is. All right, there's, um, there's <clears throat> the initial response. Limited access highways, uh, only primary or first due units should proceed directly to the scene. What that's talking about when they say first do, um, for most fire departments, if, if there's a big wreck, they may send two or three units, engine, trucks, whatever. The, the very first one should be the ones going to the scene if there's limited access on the highway. For example, okay, we had, we had a good wreck today on I-85 to all the construction. Did y'all run into that today? Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> all right, so we know one lane is, is open. We don't, want to add, we don't want to add three or four more trucks to it unless we have to. So what we can do is send the first crew, the first due units, uh, to, the, to that wreck scene so they can start patient care, and then they can radio back to the other crews, but the other crews can respond from the station but stage on the bridge or stage onto the on-ramp. So they're ready if you need us, but we don't want to get in the way. All right, so that's what this is talking about. So be mindful as you're driving these ambulances to these calls, just be mindful of how much you're gonna you're gonna block track. So it's all right. Hang with us. All right, on scene, uh, <coughs> units should park single file in the same direction to minimize on scene congestion. And you, you know, my best example is I-85. This is where it's most dangerous. Um, I've almost been killed on I-85. Most people I've worked with seem like they've always been killed on I-85. It's just part of it. Uh, so, yes? I have a student get killed on I-85. She has a student get killed on I-85. So, I, I like to use it in, as, an, as an example. And with the wreck today, it seems like it fits. Uh, park single file in the same direction to minimize congestion. You know, if, if we start bringing in a bunch of different ambulances, and fire trucks and we start parking kind of different ways, we can really stop up the interstate. You'll have police department jumping down your throat because their job is to keep the traffic flowing and our job is, is to shut it down. So you, you're seeing conflicting mindsets already. And that's what happens. So you get people really upset. So park single file. Blocking, uh, positioning blocking the apparatus. Create one and a half to two lanes blocked, okay? So, kind of contradicting a little bit. Park single file, if you can, but now we're going to block traffic. So, we're going to start drawing. Do we have any markers? Light blue? Mm. Let's see what happens. Alright, so we have a wreck scene here. All right, everybody good with that? Bad. <laughs> okay. Now, if, if I'm pulling in, I need to block this, okay? Oncoming traffic is going this way, okay? 
you're first arriving on scene with an ambulance or a fire truck, we need to protect these people and protect ourselves. So when we pull up, we need to block one and a half to two lanes. So our apparatus, when we park, needs to at least be like this. One and a half, if not the whole two lanes. All right, now we have a safe working zone from here up. If anybody hits us, the energy is going to be transferred and move, move this way. So think about creating yourself a safe zone. I thought about this uh, last week. I went to a call. Uh, there was a wreck in the middle of an intersection. Um, I had traffic coming this way. She had, she had just stopped, and, and they were out. And I'm seeing cars coming up the road and, and seeing the green light, and they're just, they're just going. So I just pull up my truck and I block that to give us a safe working zone. So just be mindful of, of the flow of traffic and, and where your safe working zones are. So that's what that's talking about. Let's block it. Position the apparatus uh, at angle. Front wheels rotate away from the incident. So if it does get hit, then it takes all that energy and it pushes the ambulance away and not into you. That's the last thing we want to happen is, is everybody else gets hurt along with the patients that are already there. Everybody get that concept? It's not complex. All right. Position other apparatus. Leave space immediately next uh, to crash for vehicle extrication units. You know, depending on what it is, you have to kind of think about what's going on. If they're called for extrication, don't pull super close up to it because you know they've got to get equipment out. There's going to be a bunch of other trucks. You know, even though you're the ambulance on scene, give them some space because we can always get the stretcher and the stretcher has wheels, right? <laughs> so we can roll them when we get them out. No big deal. So we don't need the ambulance right next to the vehicle. Now, if it's just a single car wreck, uh, no, people are slightly injured, but it's not extrication, yeah, go ahead and pull the ambulance closer. Seeing the difference here? All right, we're going to get uh, more into extrication equipment here in just a minute, but um, when you hear about extrication, Hey, park my ambulance a little bit further away than I normally would to allow the extrication team to get all their equipment out, all their tools out, and have plenty of working room. Position the ambulance, uh, the command vehicle, and other units downstream from the, from the crash. Allow safer patient loading and rapid departure from the scene. What this is talking about is let's go back to I-85. We have crash. Bad. All right. You need to pull past it. All right. If that's our crash, all right, we know that that extrication team is coming. We know this is bad. We can hear it on the radio. Have y'all all heard a, a wreck and you're like, oh my goodness, this is going to be terrible? You can hear it on the radio. All right. When I get there, I'm, I'm going to pull around it. I'm going to park my ambulance right here. Okay? I'm going to let the fire truck and extrication team park right here. For a couple reasons. First, their truck is bigger. It's heavier, so it's going to absorb more impact. It's bigger, so it's going to take up more room. So it gives me a, a larger cone of safety, right? And, and last, as they get out of equipment and they're working in this area, they're working all in here. Once you get the patient out, you have a clear route to the ambulance. And guess what? All the traffic is stopped. So the ambulance can take off to the hospital with clear lane. Instead of being parked back here and being jammed up with police officers, with other fire trucks, and then you have to move apparatus around to get out to go down the street. You notice some difference? So just think about that as y'all are as y'all starting to drive these ambulances. <clears throat> All right. Exit vehicle safety zone. That's kind of what I was talking about. I know when I'm riding in, in the fire truck, I'll tell my crew, get out on the officer side, which is the passenger side. Get on the officer side or get on the driver side because we have a walk through. If you have, uh, if you're on an ambulance and y'all are students now, but when y'all when y'all are operating it, you can tell the student in the back that hey, get out to the back or you get out through the side. That kind of helps them know where the traffic's coming. So, 
try to try to really watch for the safety zones. Be alert to oncoming traffic. Uh, we were on <clears throat> on scene was it last summer, maybe two summers ago. We had a little brush fire on the interstate. The police said they had blocked the road off, and my pump operator is standing. You know, our fire trucks got the you know all the handles and things, whatever. He's standing on the side operating it, giving us water so we can put it out. And some car was doing like 65 miles an hour and came about that far from the truck and he had to jump onto the pump panel to keep from getting hit. Alright? So, be alert to oncoming traffic. Good thing he was kind of spry. If it was an old guy, he probably wouldn't have made it. So, always keep your head on a swivel. Place flares uh, or cones to slow traffic and direct away from the incident lane. I think this is absolutely ridiculous that we would place flares, okay? That went out in the 80s because we figured out that in car wrecks, what do you, we usually find around car wrecks? Gasoline. Gasoline. Mm, combustion and chemicals. Yeah. So that's not good. Um, all we got away from that practice in 1982, that tells you something. And we're behind the time. All right, so <laughs> we use cones <coughs> to set up. Um, and then, you know what? Call for PD. The best weapon you have is a radio. Hey, if, if you don't think this is safe, what do you do? Get help. Yeah, get some help. Call PD. Hey, we need some, we need some PD to direct traffic. They, that's their job. They're good at that. Not operations. Shut off vehicles, uh, white response light and headlights. All right. The white response light. Y'all know what that is? You know what, you know what I'm talking about? No. All right, the strobes, strobes, the two in front, they're white. All right, typically uh, on a new apparatus, it is designed when you put the, when you put the vehicle in park or you pull the, the parking brake, the air brakes, that those go off automatically. <clears throat> now, those, before, that, that was, that was a, they, they kept, they stayed up, so you had to actually manually turn them off. So just make sure those are off. And headlights. Headlights, if you're using them to light a scene, that's okay. But if you're using them and they're pointing in, in, into traffic, you're just blinding other drivers. So think about that. Also, uh, life flight, helicopter. All right, they wear night vision goggles. All right, so when they land and everybody has their headlights facing toward the landing zone, they can't see. The pilot cannot see. So he's going to ask for you to turn those lights off. So just think about where your lights are pointing after you position it. So do you get on scene, where do I need to put it? Put this ambulance. Uh, let's put it on the other side of this, this rat for right now. And we're going to probably land a helicopter somewhere close to turn these lights off. Just think about that. Is it safe to enter the highway scene? You, you gotta ask yourself the question. Um, I, I always make sure PD is on the scene, especially on, a, on interstate, so that they can slow traffic down or stop it. Just whatever you gotta do. Um, which units are necessary? That's what I was talking about before. If you get on scene, maybe you're first on scene to the um, to an incident. Uh, I talked to an ETS crew just the other day, and they were we were talking about an accident, and they were like, "Yeah, we were the first ones here. You know, there's nobody else here." Well, then you can kind of say, "What do I need?" Well, I need PD, police department, to, to direct traffic, right? Um, are they stuck in the car? Can they get out? If they can't, then let's get somebody here that can get them out. So, and then if you roll a bunch of people, start saying, I need you to stage somewhere. So stage on the on ramp. It's okay. We appreciate you coming. Just stay right there for right now. We may need you in just a second. We do that a lot at, at the fire department. All right. Vehicle extrication. Extrication, I've gone to a lot of classes on extrication. I've been to a lot of extrication scenes, and it is an art. It really is. To get good at extrication, you just have to do it. All right? It's one of those things you have to show up, put your hands on it, and, and spread the doors open, and practice on different vehicles. So, that's it. We have 10 phases. I would see those as pretty good test questions. <clears throat> of an extrication. And this one, I mean, for us in here, we're, we're mainly studying 
patient care, right? You know what we're doing? So as you're inside with the patient, I want you to, you, you can look at this scene and start thinking about these 10 steps and note how close are they to getting, getting us out. All right. <clears throat> Several years ago, I was, in, I was uh, on an extrication team. The lady took us an hour and a half to extricate her. We were <clears throat> on North College. A truck flipped on top of her, a box truck, and, we, and it smashed the A-post into her, into her shoulder. And the whole dash was on, sitting on top of her. So it took us an hour and a half. And so we had ETS sitting there. We had life flight landed, shut down the helicopter. And, and the guys were sitting there, and they had already established IVs. They were getting um, a set of bottles every five minutes. They would already done all their, everything they could do, uh, blood pressure, all that good stuff. And so they're, they're, just, they're talking with us, hey, hey, we're asking them, hey, how about the patient? And they're telling us, oh, she's crashing, or she's good, you know, back and forth. She kind of was in and out. <clears throat> so, the first thing, prepping for rescue. As you, you kind of start to do that when you hear the call come out, all right? Um, you're riding down, you, you get in the truck, riding down the road, you start getting inf more information about the wreck, multiple call-ins. Um, PD's on scene, advising that patients can't get out, they're in trap. So we're going to start prepping for rescue. We're going to make sure we have our, our the proper PPE, which is which PPE? Personal protective equipment. Personal protective equipment. All right. <clears throat> so we're going to make sure we got that. We got our mindset. Okay. When we get there, we want to size up the situation. You can do a 360 where you get out, and you walk around it. Uh, but if I'm driving up on it. I can see most of what I want to see by driving around it. You know? On this situation, I get there, I see the back end, drive around to the to the front of the crash, and I can see everything I want to see. So you want to size it up. Recognize and manage any hazards. What kind of hazards? Gasoline. Well, traffic. Traffic, yes. What else? Maybe you have power lines down. Has anybody been to a wreck with power lines down? You will eventually. <laughs> <clears throat> All right. Stabilizing a uh, vehicle prior to entering. <clears throat> I can't tell you how many times I've been to a car wreck. And it could be a simple car wreck. And you get there, talking to the patient, the patient gets out, no big deal, we're good. And you notice the car's still running, and it's in drive. Because they, they get in a car wreck, and just, you know, like everybody's been in a car wreck, it kind of freaks you out, right? Tell me it doesn't. <clears throat> you don't freak out. Oh, there you go. He's never been in one. Well, when you do, you might freak out. You get really nervous, and you don't. You just forget. You, you want to check on the other people. You want to look at the damage. You want to make sure you're okay. Whatever. You forget to turn it off and put. You know, and put it in park. So make sure that the vehicle's not going to go anywhere. Put your parking brakes on. Uh, put the, put put it in park. Just turn the car off. Yeah. So make sure it's stabilized. Gain access to the patient. <clears throat> a lot of times if we have an extrication, I want somebody in that vehicle talking to the patient. Has to be. Calling the patient down, uh, get a set of vitals, sample history, OPQRST. We need someone to stabilize the C-spine, right? We got a lot we need to do this patient. So we, got, we need to get access. I, if you got one driver, how are you going to get access? Do what? Passenger seat. You get into the passenger seat. Back seat, depending on the situation. Yeah, back seat. I try to get in from the furthest direction away. Get in. Maybe bust a bust a glass. Get in. All right. Six. Providing primary patient assessment and rapid uh, trauma exam. You know, we do a trauma exam here. You know, everybody's done a trauma assessment here. It's nice because we're in the middle of a room. Let the patient out. It's like, oh yeah. You know, you know, check your PMS. How you gonna check your PMS if the foot's tied up around the gas pedal? You know, it's tough. But look, you ain't got nothing else better to do. She ain't going nowhere. You ain't going nowhere. So you can do the best that you can. All right. You obviously we can't assess the back too much, but you can ask him about it. All right. You can't assess the the rear end, the, the back of the legs too much because they're sitting. 
but you can get most of what you need to do. So uh, you can start start trying to get that. Disentangle the patient, and this may take a while. <clears throat> Good communication. EMS folks that are talking to the patient, they need to be talking to the rescue crew, the extrication crew, saying what what their patient is. All right, what what's going on? Is the patient crashing? Is the patient unconscious? Is the patient stable? Because it may determine how fast we get this patient out. Are we going to take kind of an aggressive approach to extrication? Or are we going to just say, hey, we're going to make this super nice and easy and clean? It may take a little bit longer. So good communication from inside the car and outside the car. Immobilizing the extrication patient from, how would we do that? Anybody got an idea? KED, what's another way? Long board, yeah, that's right. Providing assessment, care, and transport. So this is uh, where we got them on the stretcher. We're starting to move them to the ambulance, and we're starting to get them out of the, get them out of the scene. And terminating rescue. That's where you clean it up. So uh, in this case, you can think about it like we had a bad accident. Has everybody had a chance to see the helicopter land? Been a part of that? Maybe no, during clinicals? No. A lot of times when we provide care and, and transport, we'll take them to the ambulance, kind of package them, clean up any wounds, splint anything we can, make sure we got the IVs established. We land the helicopter, helicopter takes off, we terminate the rescue after that. Kind of good mental picture. <clears throat> any questions on these 10? The order? Pretty simple. Any comments, thoughts? All right. All right, a couple years ago, it was around 2008 or 9. Um, we are we are now required to wear safety vests on the scenes. That's why uh, when y'all come in here, one of the things that you have to take to the clinical is safety vests. And y'all are like, where do I get these things? Um, big pushback from a lot of fire departments, police officers. <laughs> And old guys have been in the field, they didn't want to wear it. But uh, but now it's a, it's, a, it's a big deal. So, have to wear your safety vest. <clears throat> All right, so what does the scene size up tell me about the, the need for extrication? So, if I get to a, a car wreck, what is, it, what is it telling me about the need for extrication? It may tell me, do I need to extrication? Her door, the, the driver's door may be locked and you can't get into it, you know, pinned, but the passenger side door may be open. Uh, you could arrive on it and be like, oh, dear Lord, stay away. All right, you, you, you don't know how anybody's alive in there. So make sure you do a good scene size up. All right, now when we're, when we're doing extrication, there's a lot of glass, sharp metal. Um, there's a lot of things that could, that could hurt you pretty good on there. So we require helmets, eye protection, hand protection, and body protection. So this is all your PPE. Um, I know that most ambulance services do not have this stuff, but this is, like I said, just an overview. overview. <coughs> when you're cutting, when you're using you know, the jaws of life or the whatever you want to call them, and you're cutting, those things cut that metal so easy. It's unbelievable. A lot of times it'll pop. So make sure you have eye protection. If you're sitting in the car, make sure you have eye protection. Now, could they borrow a, a turnout jacket from, do you uh, ever carry extras, or borrow something from somebody on scene if they had to climb in the back? <coughs> That's a great question. We do not carry extras. But we, what we can do is get a blanket from the ambulance. And a lot of times what we've done is uh, whoever's in the car with the patient can cover the patient and themselves with a blanket or a sheet so that none of the glass or any flying debris gets on either one of them. So um, a lot of times that's what we'll do, just put a blanket. Uh, some of the volunteer departments carry, may have an extra jacket, I don't know. I know that we do not have an extra jacket on the truck with us, um, but we do have blankets and sheets and stuff like that that you can put over whoever's inside. And that needs to happen before it starts. 
I also like to have anybody who's inside to put a helmet on. Um, we can we can scrounge up another helmet. Use flares to control traffic. I don't, I don't know about that. I don't, I don't know that I agree with that one. You think they don't let you only use flares because they don't think they're safe? <laughs> That's a good point. Maybe. We may not be able to use flares because we're not safe enough. The fire is safe. It gets lonely sometimes. Um, it says avoid uh, spill fuel. Don't. Uh, wave flares and in 10 feet intervals. I, I have a big problem with flares. <laughs> what do you put out at night? You know, so like, you know, the wreck that happened on the interstate this morning, they said the guy kind of popped the, the panel, the police car parked with all the lights on. Mm -hmm. So you don't have access, the police aren't there yet. What would you put out at night time for someone to come on? We have reflective cones. Okay. Reflective cones. As long as they have their headlights on. You know? They don't always. Use your reflective cones and, and a police officer. Hey. Should you know? Should. Just saying. You know, has anybody seen these new LEDs that police officers have? Yes. Holy cow. Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh. If you don't see that. Gee, yes. All right. Supplemental restraint systems. Airbags. Woo. Airbags are designed to inflate and impact, uh, dissipate kinet kinetic energy, minimize trauma to the body. I think we know what, what these are. <clears throat> they're super awesome. If you're in the car and you're in a wreck. After that, I'm not a big fan. <laughs> Alright, let me explain why I said that. Alright, so if you're in a car, I think the new Volvos, y'all can help me out with this. The new Volvos, Mercedes, have like 17 or 18 different airbags on them. The side curtain airbags, I think they got leg airbags. Yeah. yeah, they have like the whole body encapsulated airbag. Comes around, I'm kidding. All right, um, but th they're great. You know, I've seen a lot of people that are just like, "Oh my gosh, this car's destroyed. How are you walking around right now?" Well, they landed in the airbag. They're fantastic. Um, so, a lot of the cars have them. Now, when they deploy, has anybody had an airbag pop in their face? Is it smoking? Oh, do you remember? The, you don't remember. The only thing I wanted to do was get out of that vehicle now. Yeah. Yeah. All right, so the airbag is folded up nice and neat, okay, when, they, when it comes to the manufacturer. And they put powder in there to keep it from sticking. They want it to deploy correctly, right? They don't want the plastic to stick. So they put this powder in it. When it does, it's like someone take a baby powder bomb inside a car. I couldn't see. I couldn't breathe. Yeah. I had to get out of there. And people think the car's on fire. So here you are in a wreck. <laughs> and it's spinal injury. It's like, oh, my God, the car's on fire. I'm jumping out. That happened. Alright? So, just know what it is. It just, it, it's a distinct smell to it. Just know what it is. A car's not actually on fire, it's just the dust. Alright. Uh, Cornstarch and talcum powder. And, uh, mm -hmm. So, that's what it is. Now, let's go back to these. Alright. <clears throat> I don't like airbag systems once the car's been wrecked. Alright? Because if a Volvo has 17 airbags and half of them deploy, how do we know that the rest of them are not going to deploy as I'm doing patient care? Huh? You don't? That's right. You can YouTube, you can go online and see tons of videos where somebody's doing extrication or patient care and an airbag pops in their face and kills them. Yeah, we've been trying, even if you disconnect the battery, still be aware because they will still even explode. That's right. That's exactly right. So, part of the fire department's standard operating procedure is to disconnect the batteries. All right, so it'll kind of de-energize itself. But it still ha may, it has a capacitor in there, and the capacitor is like a really good battery. All right, so um, it, it, it just has to de-energize. And it may take a couple minutes. I, I know the first generation airbags took 20 minutes. These new inter, um, airbags, not as much time. So, um, so just be very aware of that. There's a Mercedes-Benz convertible that has the back seat has a roll bar that uh, on a as it rolls over whatever 
and has the airbags that pop in front, but also has a roll bar that shoots up and locks. Just imagine if that thing went off as you're trying to climb around that vehicle. Yeah, it would catch it. All right, now these airbags are pretty powerful. Has anybody seen that, um, that, that people put airbags in their people's seats and they pop them and they shoot up? It's kind of silly. All right, for an example, I took a 50, I was goofing around, if y'all could imagine that. And <clears throat> we were doing extrication class, and so I took, a, took one of these out. And I set a 55 gallon metal drum, kind of heavy, had a little water in it, set it up under there, and I used my, before I had an iPhone, I used my old cell phone battery to, to charge it. And it shot the 55 gallon drum 20 feet in air. Yeah. So this thing comes out with some force. So. All right. Electrical hazards. High voltage lines are common. I think we, that's kind of a dust statement. We know that. <clears throat> Assume the area around the exposed uh, wire dangerous uh, conductors may have, uh, may, uh, may have touched and, in, and energized. All right, there was a, a storm that came through Auburn uh, maybe a year or two ago, and there was a, you know, the Letta bus, the public transit bus, you know, it picks up people and takes them. All right, so this, this bus driver, she's driving down a residential street, and a tree lands, it crushes her windshield, crushes into her, and it's, and it's sitting just about right here on her. All right, but it had electrical lines laying on top of it, and it's pouring down right. What do you do? She's stuck in it. She can't just get out. Call the fire department. Call the fire department. They'll get it. Yeah, we will. Call the fire department. That's exactly right. So, we get on scene, and we see this. I'm not pulling my truck even near that thing. All right? I don't know if the water on the ground is energized because some power lines are touching the ground. I don't know what's energized. So, we walk kind of to where she can see us, but on a high side, away from where the water in the car were. And she is losing her mind inside that car, screaming bloody murder. Get me out! All right? So I, I, I tell her, call a phone number. Call this phone number. And it was my phone number. I haven't had my cell phone with me. So she calls me. So I'm able to talk to her and calm her down while we're waiting on the power company to get there. And she was not too happy with the power company because they took about 30 minutes to get to it. She was pretty upset. But we have to, we have to assume that those logs are charged. And sure enough, they work. So, uh, ordinary uh, protective clothing gives no protection against electrocution. So, don't, that's kind of the rule in public safety. You don't mess with, with electricity, period. End of story. I don't care what's going on. They just gonna have to sit tight until we, you know, until we can get that power turned off. So. Can anybody ever play with power lines? Play with it? I hadn't seen him play with it. It's amazing. They just go up there and do it, and the power is just sparking everywhere, and they just like, it's no big deal. I'm just like, just, just All right, <clears throat> vehicle fires. All right, so remember what I said at the beginning of class. What was it? Know your role. Let me tell you something. EMS folks, all right, we like firemen because they're going to come help us, right? Help us load patients, help us extricate. They're strong, they, you know, some of them. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so you don't want to make them mad. All right, look, I'm not going to go arrest somebody. I'm not going to make the police mad. If you see a car fire, please don't put it out. That's my fun for the day, all right? I got excited when the tones dropped. I'm excited to be at work. I'm going to go put this car fire. This is the best day I've had all week. Don't mess with that. Don't take that away. Leave it be. All right? So I had a police officer come to me. He said, hey, man, can I get an extinguisher? I said, sure, just let me have your gun. It'll be all right. <laughs> all right. But we'll touch on it. Just keep that in the back of your mind when you see a car fire. Car fire car, all right? Sit back and watch. Patient care. All right. Small fires. 15 to 20 pound uh, class ABC dry can fire extinguisher. Extinguishes almost anything burning. Yeah, ish. Yeah, ish. Um, so, 
You, you can do a lot with an extinguisher. You have to carry an extinguisher on the truck. Call the fire <laughs> Fire under the hood, do not attempt to extinguish unless the hood is fully open. When have you ever, I, I don't know in my years of doing this that I've ever seen a car fully involved and the hood's open. Like, oh, king, going. All right. Oh, there you go, she has. But the guy was trying to burn it on purpose. Boom, there you go. All right. Just left the fire department handle it. All right. Vehicle fires. Now, the deal with vehicle fires. Fire and passenger department apply extinguishers sparingly to occupants speed. Oh, whatever. Fire and trunk. Let me tell you a little bit about car fires. All right? Car fires. Car fires, 99% of the time, are going to start in the engine compartment. Because you need heat and fuel. You don't find heat and fuel in a trunk. <laughs> Unless there's a problem. Huh? A Unless there's a what? A beetle bug. A <laughs> unless the unless the engine's in the rear of the truck, yes. But it's going to be where yeah, whatever. It's going to be where the motor is. Okay. Now there's been several occasions where people tried to burn cars on purpose, uh, where they put gasoline on top and then light that on fire, and you show up and the hoods on or the top parts on fire, and, and the engine part is fine. You're like, oh, burning. All right, so uh, fire in the trunk, that'd be silly. So apply some same principles as an engine compartment. You see that? Don't put it out. Okay. What's in the trunk that started the fire? I don't know. I don't want to be near it. Feel me? We got problems. So vehicle fires, the big thing there is that the, the tires are going to pop, okay? It's not going to explode. Hollywood has so done a good job. Oh, it's going to blow up. No, it doesn't. Okay? First, old cars have relief valves in the gas tanks, all right, that allow all the gas just to drain out. And it may be burning as it drains out, but it's going to drain out. And also, you know where you fill your car up? You know? That's a rubber tube. All right? So it can't build up the pressure to explode. And all the new cars are fiberglass. So they just melt. Okay, so don't worry about the huge explosion that Hollywood has told us. But now, the tires on there will pop and scare you half to death. All right, uh, downtown Auburn, one of the gas stations, middle of the night, uh, there was a car next to a tank, there's a tanker truck here, a car getting gas, and gas pumps. The car is fully involved, all right? I'm riding in a different truck, and I get there, and I'm putting my gear on, and I'm watching the crew stretch a fire hose, and they go between the gas tank, truck, and the car that's burning, and they're, they're starting to fight this fire. And I'm looking at this thinking, this is not good. And I'm putting my mask on, and I'm looking, and all of a sudden, two of the tires blow at the same time. Boom! And all those guys hit the dirt. <laughs> <laughs> they said it was, they thought it was the end of their life. They were like, oh, we're done. Yeah. All right, so the, the, the tires will pop, and it'll scare people, but that's it. That's it. That's it. Now, uh, the bumpers, bumpers are hazardous. Bumpers, some, some of them have shocks, okay? So absorb the impact. Well, that's filled with the, with the oil. And now when they get hot, they can blow off. And they can take the legs off with them. All right, so they come out pretty fast. So you want to stay away from the bumpers, front and back, and just get people away from it. All right, so as EMS, if you arrive on scene to a car fire, or even just PD, or you're, you're just in your personal vehicle, and you want to stop and help, just get people away and call. Fire department. That's right. Don't put them out. Okay. So, don't worry about explosions. All right. Stabilizing the vehicle. Vehicle on wheels. That's handy. Uh, turn off the engine and um, step chalk three sides. Now, you see these? These are kind of hard to see. Can I see those right there? They call them step chalks because they kind of get bigger. They look like little steps. All right. When stabilizing the vehicle, you want to shove at least three of these under the car. It kind of helps hold it. So it's not going to rock, it's not going to move, it's not going to take off on you. <coughs> Turn off the engine. We talked about that a little bit earlier. Super important. Make sure it's not going to move. Anymore. Now, just a thought. We're going to use critical thinking. If I put these step chalks in there, right, 
Okay? That's what it says. That's how we're going to stabilize. And then let's say I'm going to take a step further because I'm going to I'm going to put the step chocks in there and I'm going to pop the tires. Awesome. Is that a good idea? No. Why not? How you put the chocks out? So we get the people out now, what? How am I going to get my chocks out? Oh, the fire department. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Good point. When, you don't want to pop the tires. Leave the tires on there. Just put the step cribbin under there and just leave it there. That's good enough. Stabilizing the vehicle on the side. There's a number of different things that you can use to stabilize the vehicle on the side. Um, you, we've got air shores. That's what these are. Uh, they have what they would call rescue jacks. They're like big, long jacks. All kinds of different manufacturers. <clears throat> I played with a lot of them, and and all you're doing is creating a triangle, right? Making sure this thing doesn't rock. Um, so, if you, one thing EMS can do is um, working with a rescue crew, working with extrication, and say, "Hey, look, this vehicle looks un unstable. Can we stabilize that?" Because when they get there, they're excited. It's the best thing they've had going all day. So they, they, get, they may forget to s stabilize it. So you help with safety. And just say, hey, do, can y'all stabilize it? Can y'all make sure you keep it from rocking? You know, that, that may be a helpful reminder to them. So. You can stabilize cars on their side with just about anything, as long as it doesn't keep it from moving. Um, these air shores are great. Rescue jacks are great. Uh, they look just like this. Um, you can stay, I've, we've had to stabilize them up against trees before. You just take some rope and wrap around the tree that it's leaning up against, stuff like that. Just to keep the, just to make sure that when we're working around this vehicle, it's not going to move. Can you explain cribbing? That's just kind of not yes. a word in everybody's language. Yes. Cribbing is something, is, is what we, you, the, the wood blocks or the composite blocks, these right here, to help stabilize. All right, let's go back. These, these are called step cribbing. And it's just, you, you can use uh, four by fours. You, you used to have made out of wood. And, uh, and it may be wedges, it may be blocks, it may be just chunks of wood. It's, it's stuff we use just to stabilize the vehicle. That's all it is. What about those little things you blow up? The airbags? I thought we were getting, is that coming later in the chapter? Yeah, I think it's coming up. Um, but the cribbing is, is the wood block. So if you see them out uh, with the wood or the, the black composite, looks like plastic all molded up, that's, that's cribbing. Another thing we can do if, is if there's a patient that's lifted, uh, that, that's up under the vehicle, we can use airbags. Not the airbags that are in your car, but these really thick rubber, super hardcore airbags to lift the vehicle off the ground. Um, that can lift a lot. I lifted a, a, a mobile home with it. With that tub. A guy was working on plumbing, and he was working on his plumbing, and the uh, he knocked the supports out from under his house, and the house fell on top of him, and we had to get him out from under it. So we, we actually used the airbags to lift him out. No. <coughs> no. No. So, that's what it is. Stabilizer bars, you, you know, these are called different things, but that's what it is. The big thing for y'all to remember is to be looking for this when you get on scene. Because if I need to try to work on a patient inside there, I need to make sure it's stable, scene safe, right? So when you get there in the fire department, whoever's working on there, make sure that they put stuff like that out. Make sure the car doesn't move. I don't want that car to move at all. Vehicles on the roof. Utilize four by four, four wood blocks to build a crib box. And a crib box, I forgot the. You can draw on that slide. Yeah, I can't do that. I can't. <laughs> take, 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 take. <laughs> All right, so cribbing, we have uh, we have a ton of it, and it's four by four blocks. All right, so this will come out. This will come out. All right, 
see, we can, it's four by fours that are stacked on top of each other. Two on the bottom, then two going the other way, then two going the other way. You see what I'm saying? You kind of see when my picture is terrible drawing. All right, and that each point, depending on what material it is, can hold 16,000 pounds, I want to say, each point of contact. Mm, 16, it's either 16 or 24, I can't remember. But it holds a lot of weight. So we, as we lift a vehicle up, or let's say the, the car is upside down, and now it's rocking on its roof, right? Well, I can put these up under the hood to stabilize it. See what I'm saying? So that's cribbing. That's what that's called. All right. Gaining access. All right, <clears throat> gaining access. We talked a little bit about that. We'll talk a little bit about it more. A simple access. Look, check, check to make sure the doors can open. All right? I was on scene years and years ago. I think it was back in like 2000. I would get a car wreck, and this guy took an axe. All right, the patient is sitting in the driver's seat. He took an axe, and he's fixing to swing it to the driver's door to break the window. All right, uh, the captain had to stop him from doing that. Kind of ran him off. All right, the, it was a four-door car. The, the door right behind the driver's door was open. He just open it. <laughs> It's silly, but you're thinking, oh, I saw someone to bust out a window. Go, if it's a four-door car, make sure you check all the, the doors. Just make sure that they're open. So we have the saying, try before you pry. This is funny. Fire department guys, they'll, they'll get to a door and the house is burning. They're all excited. They're, they're kicking the door and it's not going anywhere. And like, oh my. It's not doing anything. All right. <laughs> all right, so we have the saying, try before you pry, okay? Think about opening all the doors first before you go busting out windows, yeah. You know what really adds insult to injury is What's a that? woman firefighter opens the door. See? <laughs> that we have that happen in my department. All right, complex access. Utilize tools and equipment. Break glass in the side or rear as far from the passengers as possible. Okay, so we want to do it as far away as possible. Now, if the car runs into a building and there's no way to get access to the front or the sides, you know what? We may have to go straight to the trunk. And we can do that. We can make it happen. So we can, it may get complicated, but we can make it happen. And when you're breaking glass, make sure you go the furthest away. Make sense? Common sense now, but when you get adrenaline going, it's like this goes out the window somewhere. All right, disentangle. <clears throat> uh, gaining access by disposing of doors and roof. So we can make a convertible out of the car pretty quick. All right. Um, I, I, I'm a big fan of that because I feel like I can get a lot of contact with the patient. It's easier to get the patient out. A lot of people can help you get the patient out without moving the patient too much if you just take the roof off. Um, so we can take a four-door car in one side, we can take all two doors off and put it out so you can get access to it. All right, that can happen. Uh, make vehicle interior accessible. Whatever you gotta do, create large ex exit highway, provides fresh air and helps cool heated patients. Um, you know, y'all are looking at this with fresh eyes. If you see something that, that could be done, uh, a lot of times you can get tunnel vision. The guys working the tools, the guys, you know, that are that are out there uh, doing education can get tunnel vision and forget. Hey, you know, I'm, I'm really focusing on this one door. And then you look and you say, hey, why don't you just take the top off real quick? Oh, yeah, that's great. I did that. Make a suggestion. Good communication. All right. Disentangling occupants by displacing the front end. Um, we can roll the dash. A lot of times you go to a car rack. And the person is actually doing okay, but the dash is sitting on their legs, and now they can't get their legs out. So we may just have to push the dash up off of them. Um, easy accomplish uh, using heavy jacks and a hacksaw. Well, I've tried that. Um, the hacksaw takes a long time. Uh, you know what a sawzall is? It's a little saw. It has a blade that sticks out and it just reciprocates, goes back and forth. That is fantastic. Okay, that works really good. Hacksaw, I, I 
No. <laughs> <laughs> we had a race one time. We lost. All right, so uh, do not cut steering column or airbag wiring. May cause uh, unexpected firing. One thing that you can do uh, as you're sitting inside with a patient, um, during the extrication, the guys are going to be thinking where they're going to cut, okay, using the jaws a lot. And we do what we call a pull and peek, okay? You know the plastic in your car runs along? With we have to pull that off. Okay, because a lot of times the air containers that that that, can, that hold the, the air to deploy the airbags is sitting in those posts, and unless you take those that plastic off, you cut right through it. And now you just cut into a missile. So that's bad. So what you can do as you're sitting inside doing patient care is you're helping the guys do the pull and pee. Okay, patient care. All right. Yeah, I, I see something. I see some wiring right there. Or I see something that doesn't look right right there. Uh, may not want to cut that, or they'll have to take a second look. So help them do that, okay? That is what they're cutting. All right, so we don't cut the steering column because they are bad. Like yeah. All right. Highway operations are high-risk scene. Uh, scene size up is key to determine how many patients. Protect yourself from traffic, undeployed airbags, uh, loaded bumpers, and sharp metal. How do you protect yourself from traffic? Safety desk. Safety desk. What else? Awareness. What, awareness? Is that what you said? <laughs> yes. Um, we're best. PD. Yes. Good stuff. <coughs> Ensure scene is safe. Big deal. Try simple means of access first. What's the saying? Try before you die. That's right. Protect your uh, patient during extrication process. How do we do that? A blanket, sheets, whatever we need to cover. Highways responsible for it uh, is a significant safety hazard. Uh, there's a lot of emergency personnel <coughs> get killed every day from just being on the road. Responding units should evaluate the need for further units. Uh, make sure you block the area that you're working. Remember our cone of safety, safety zone. Exit the apparatus into safety zone as much as possible. And the ambulance is kind of tough. You're sitting back to your side, have to crawl over everybody. Um, just be very mindful of where traffic is. Use protective equipment and warning devices. Uh, vehicle extrication requires specialized training and resources. So do y'all, are y'all going to do the extrication? Mm -hmm. No. Brain answer. What are y'all going to be doing? Patient, Patient care. care. Are you going to be helping with the extrication? Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Try to be in some eyes and ears. Determine extrication resources needed <clears throat> and patient extrication priority. Uh, a good scene size up. Another scene size up is a lot on here. Mm -hmm. Extrication can uh, compose a variety of threats. Um, evaluate the scene carefully. Make sure we do a good pull and peek. Make sure we're not going to cut through the airbags. Very important. Always start simply. See if we can open the door before we go starting cutting the roof off. Any access uh, frequently requires mechanical and uh, technology. Any questions? Here's some things to think about. What's the best access uh, for my unit to the patient? Where should I park? We talked a little bit about it. We talked about parking. Um, to block the scene, we talked about parking on the other side. These are some things, even as you're starting to enter this world of riding emergency vehicles and getting on the scene, uh, you may not be driving, think about it. Uh, we're, we work as a team in everything we do. And so a lot of times if the driver may think, oh, I'm, I, I just want to get to the patient, you may need to say, hey, why don't we park on the other side? That way we have good access to get out of here. 
Uh, does the vehicle need to be stabilized? That's one of the last things a lot of people think about. Okay, everybody's ready to jump in the car, start cutting on it, start dealing with the patients, you know, do the IVs and stuff like that. Hey, make sure it's just stabilized. Make sure it's not going anywhere. Turn the car off. All right. Let's do one of these. The highway, uh, the highway crash you're dispatched to has a seven car pile up. Your uh, unit is first on scene. What steps that are required uh, that are different from those for a crash involving one car striking a tree? Yeah. Maybe do a triage. What? Multiple patients. Multiple patients. I'm going to need backup. What else? Huh? Uh, multiple yeah, we're going to need a lot of resources. We're probably going to have more room for um, gasoline spills mm -hmm. here. Some more hazards. If it's diesel involved, you have to get hazmat. Yeah, exactly. Could need hazmat. Car striking a tree, that's off the road. I, I haven't seen too many trees in a road. Civic <laughs> okay. car pile up on a highway. That's in, we, need to shut, we need to shut it down. Yeah. Yeah. It's an all day there. That might be more than seven. All right, let's take a break.